Hello, this is Eric from Stanford University. In this video, I'll be discussing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, one of the most common acute complications of cirrhosis. The learning objectives of this video are first, to be able to describe its pathophysiology, second, to be able to identify patients at risk for SBP from its risk factors and clinical manifestations, Next, to be able to diagnose SBP accurately from acidic fluid studies. And finally, to be able to prescribe appropriate treatment. Before I explain the pathophysiology, let me start by defining SBP. SBP is an infection of acidic fluid that occurs in the absence of a surgically treatable source, such as bowel perforation, biliary leak, or an intra-abdominal abscess. It's not limited to just patients with cirrhosis, though the vast majority of patients with SPP do have that diagnosis. You may be already wondering about some specific etiologies of peritonitis, whether they are included in this designation of SPP. For example, peritonitis that occurs in the setting of pre-existing bacteremia. While that isn't a surgically treatable problem, it isn't really spontaneous either. But although it may not make sense, we still consider situations like that to be SBP. So how does SBP develop in the body? The cirrhotic liver causes a lot of pathophysiologic changes in the body. One of those is altered motility of the small bowel. With a contribution from the near ubiquitous use of proton pump inhibitors in cirrhotics, there is an overgrowth of gut flora. In addition, cirrhosis also leads to an increase in bowel permeability a process called bacterial translocation. This does not mean that the bacteria literally seep through the bowel wall directly into the surrounding acidic fluid. Instead, bacteria work their way into the lymphatics and travel to mesenteric lymph nodes. Once in the lymph nodes, there are several mechanisms as to how the bacteria physically get into the acidic fluid, all of which are speculative. Another major contributing factor to the development of SBP has to do with the cirrhotic liver's effect on the immune system. Since most of complement is produced by the liver, cirrhosis predictably leads to decreased complement levels. Cirrhosis is also associated with a reduction in the function of polymorphonuclear cells. These together, likely with other minor immune problems, result in an acquired immune deficiency. So it's the combination of bacterial overgrowth in the gut increased susceptibility to translocation, and an impaired immune system that ultimately leads to SBP. As an alternative category of mechanisms, there is also extension or seeding from other infections such as UTIs or bacteremia. In addition to this pathogenesis, there are also several well-established risk factors for SBP, some of which you may be able to guess. They are a prior episode of SBP, a total protein in the ascites fluid of under 1 gram per deciliter, active upper GI hemorrhage, not necessarily limited to a variceal bleed, serum bilirubin above 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, which is probably just a marker of severity of cirrhosis, and use of a proton pump inhibitor. SBP risk is also related to the etiology of ascites. It typically only occurs in ascites related to portal hypertension, nephrotic syndrome, and peritoneal dialysis. For those unfamiliar with that last term, peritoneal dialysis is an alternative to hemodialysis for patients with kidney failure. While it's possible for malignant ascites and other forms of ascites to become infected, it is far less common. So what are the clinical manifestations of SBP? The first thing to realize is that SBP presents very differently than the peritonitis most of us learned about in medical school. Traditional peritonitis, which is usually from a surgical problem like a perforated appendix or ulcer, presents with acute abdominal pain and so-called peritoneal signs such as a diffusely rigid abdomen, sometimes referred to as a washboard abdomen, there's also a finding called rebound tenderness, in which the clinician compares the pain generated by slowly applying greater amounts of pressure to the abdomen and the pain generated by abruptly releasing the pressure. 
rebound tenderness is reported to be present when the pain upon release is greater than that caused by pushing down. These signs are common in secondary or surgical peritonitis, but not in SBP. In SBP, common findings include abdominal tenderness without rigidity, fever, and altered mental status. Those classic peritoneal signs of rigidity and rebound tenderness are usually absent. And in my experience, the typical patient diagnosed with SBP presents with diffuse, vague abdominal pain with only modest tenderness, and the presence of altered mental status is as pronounced as abdominal findings. And to build upon that, a significant minority of patients with SBP have no abdominal symptoms or physical findings in the abdomen at all. Therefore, one must have a low threshold to evaluate for SBP in patients with ascites secondary to portal hypertension, nephrotic syndrome, or peritoneal dialysis. And the only way to diagnose SBP is with a procedure called a paracentesis. A paracentesis is a bedside procedure in which a needle and catheter are introduced transcutaneously into the peritoneal space and fluid is removed via aspiration. A diagnostic paracentesis is one in which only a small amount of fluid is removed in order to diagnose the etiology of the ascites or to rule out the presence of SBP. A therapeutic paracentesis, which is what is pictured here, is one in which the, a large amount of fluid is removed to improve symptoms caused by the fluid accumulation, such as pain and shortness of breath. Now, when I was a medical student, my supervising attendings asserted that the combination of the significant prevalence of SBP, its nonspecific presentation, and the adverse consequences if not treated, combined together to make it imperative that every patient who presented to the ER, irrespective of chief complaint, should receive a diagnostic paracentesis if they had ascites. I think the pendulum of standard of care has swung a little bit away from the idea that every patient with ascites needs a paracentesis irrespective of presenting complaint. However, I would still advocate that any patient with liver disease and ascites who presents with any abdominal symptom, including diarrhea, altered mental status, or fever without a compelling alternative diagnosis, needs the procedure. I'm not going to go into the details of how the paracentesis is actually performed. There are other videos already online that provide a great demonstration and discussion of this. A link to one particularly good one is below. But once the paracentesis is done, there is a list of specific tests which the acidic fluid should be sent for. Cell count with differential and gram stain and culture are the most important of the tests. The fluid should also be sent for albumin, total protein, glucose, and LDH. Depending upon the circumstances, it can also be sent for amylase if bowel perforation is suspected, bilirubin if biliary leak is suspected, and an AFB smear and culture if tuberculosis is considered to be a possibility. When SBP was originally described back in the 1960s, it was common for clinicians to treat the culture as a gold standard. That is, if the culture was negative, the patient was deemed to not have SBP, and antibiotics were stopped. However, we now know that acidic fluid cultures are neither sensitive nor specific. The poor sensitivity is due to the fact that the actual concentration of bacteria in the ascites is relatively low. This problem can be partially overcome by directly inoculating blood culture bottles with at least 10 milliliters of ascites fluid at the time of the procedure instead of just providing acidic fluid to the lab in a standard sterile specimen container. So once we have those labs, how does one help our diagnosis? The first question to ask does the fluid contain 250 or more polymorphonuclear cells per cubic millimeter? If you are only vaguely familiar with that term PMN, it is often used interchangeably on the wards with neutrophils, though technically PMN is a synonym for granulocyte, a category of white blood cells that also includes eosinophils and basophils. So if there are less than 250 PMNs per cubic millimeter, the patient does not have peritonitis. In current medicine, the PMN count is more or less the de facto gold standard for the diagnosis of peritonitis. If there are at least 250 PMNs, the next question to ask is how many different organisms are seen on gram stain. If there are two or more organisms, 
it is highly likely the patient has secondary peritonitis from, for example, a bowel perforation. If there are either zero or just one bacterial species seen on gram stain, ask next, what is the SAG? The SAG, or SAAG, stands for serum to ascites albumin gradient and is numerically equal to the serum albumin minus the ascites albumin. A SAG greater than 1.1 grams per deciliter can discriminate from those patients with ascites from portal hypertension versus those patients with ascites from other etiologies. Since SBP is rare outside of portal hypertension, a SAG less than 1.1 makes SBP unlikely, so you should consider secondary peritonitis instead. If the SAG is greater than 1.1 grams per deciliter, the next step is to examine the combination of the ascites glucose, ascites total protein, and the ascites LDH. Consider if two or more of the following is present. Glucose less than 50 mg per deciliter, total protein greater than 1 gram per deciliter, or LDH greater than the upper limit of normal for serum LDH. If two or more of those criteria are met, SBP is possible, but secondary peritonitis should still be considered. That collection of criteria may sound especially arbitrary, and it probably is, though it is based on published expert opinion. Finally, if there are 250 PMNs or more, zero or one organisms seen on gram stain, the SAG is greater than 1.1 grams per deciliter, and less of those two of those preceding three criteria are present, the patient has SBP. And in 2014, it is this algorithm, or one similar to it, which is now the gold standard for diagnosing this condition, rather than just a positive culture. So if the ascites fluid culture is neither sensitive nor specific, and it is not used in the diagnostic algorithm, why do we even bother to do one? It's mainly to help guide our antibiotic coverage, particularly in the event of a highly resistant pathogen. The culture can also rarely be helpful when it grows an unusual or unexpected organism, and the patient is failing to improve on conventional treatment. Finally, if the culture grows two or more organisms, but there is no other indication that the patient had secondary peritonitis, it suggests that the bowel was hit with the paracentesis needle during the procedure. In addition to what's presented in this algorithm, there are two additional diagnostic categories of which you should be aware. First, there is a situation in which there is at least 250 PMNs, but the culture is negative. I've already said that this is included in the definition of SBP, but it actually has a more specific name, culture-negative neutrocytic ascites, often abbreviated CNNA. Since it's a form of SBP, you should treat it as SBP. But what about the opposite situation, in which there are fewer than 250 PMNs, but the culture is positive? This situation is called bacteriocytes. It's relatively uncommon, and felt to represent a brief window between a discrete episode of bacterial translocation and either spontaneous resolution or the development of SBP. Because spontaneous resolution of bacteriocytes is felt to be more likely than the development of a clinically relevant infection, not everyone in this category should get treated. The common decision point is whether or not the patient has abdominal symptoms. If yes, treat as SBP. If no, closely observe them for a few days instead. So finally, let's move on to discuss treatment. Obviously, the cornerstone of treatment is antibiotics. If the clinical suspicion of SBP is moderate or high, antibiotics should be started immediately after paracentesis. If clinical suspicion is low, wait to see if the cell count confirms or refutes the diagnosis. In most labs, the cell count should take no more than an hour or two. Preferred antibiotics are primarily based on the most likely causative pathogens. It's probably not a surprise that E. coli and Klebsiella are the most common bacterial species to be isolated in SBP. A little more surprising is that Streptomoniae is also a common pathogen here. Anaerobic bacteria are relatively uncommon causes of SBP. So we need to choose an antibiotic that is active against enteric gram negatives as well as Streptococcus but we don't usually need anaerobic coverage. Therefore, the first-line agents are usually third-generation cephalosporins 
such as cefotaxime and ceftriaxone. In patients with allergy concerns, an acceptable alternative are quinolones, which in the U.S. is often levofloxacin. The duration of antibiotics is relatively short. Studies have found that a 5-day course has equal cure rates to longer ones, so 5 days is the typical duration, unless the organism that grows in culture is an unusual one, or unless the patient has persistent symptoms, in which case they may even benefit from additional studies, such as a repeat paracentesis, to demonstrate that the PMN count has actually been decreasing on treatment. In addition to antibiotics, there are two other components of the treatment protocol for SPP. Over the last 10 years or so, we have developed an increased appreciation of the role that SBP plays in triggering another acute complication of cirrhosis, the hepatorenal syndrome. Hepatorenal syndrome will be a topic of its own forthcoming video, but in extreme brief, it is the development of renal failure due to the hemodynamic changes which accompany advanced cirrhosis, which can be exacerbated by SBP. A 2013 meta-analysis of four randomized controlled trials have found that albumin infusion, in addition to antibiotics and SBP, was associated with a substantially decreased risk of both renal impairment and death compared to antibiotics alone. The pooled overall mortality rate was reduced from 35% to 16%. As a consequence, albumin infusion during an episode of SBP is now standard of care. The most common regimen which was arbitrarily created as part of the protocol used by the best known of the individual trials, is as follows. At the time of diagnosis, the patient should receive 1.5 grams of IV albumin for each kilogram of body weight, and then 48 hours later, the patient should receive 1 gram per kilogram of albumin. Finally, a relatively new finding published in the literature just this year is that continuation of non-selective beta blockers such as propranolol after a first episode of SBP was associated with a worsened long-term mortality rate and increased number of days of hospitalization. This was a retrospective study that should not necessarily be paradigm shifting on its own, but one might still consider discontinuation of beta blockers in this situation. The hypothesis behind why this was the case is just one facet of the fascinating discussion of the complex role of beta blockers in cirrhosis, for those interested, the citation for this very interesting paper is listed below. That concludes this video on spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. If you found it interesting and useful, please remember to like it, share it, and be on the lookout for forthcoming videos on hepatic encephalopathy, variceal bleeds, and the hepatorenal syndrome.